The Honourable Member for Beauport, Côte de Beaupré de l'Orléans, Charlevoix. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's a great year. It's the 40th anniversary of a flagship organization in my riding, Le Pivot. Today, I join my colleague from Beauport Limoulou in paying tribute to and highlighting the huge contribution of Le Pivot to our beautiful Beauport region every day. And in all circumstances, dozens of volunteers put their hearts into helping people in their community. Whether it's for food distribution, the thrift shop, child care assistance, or the drop-in center, the preparation of tax returns, and many other forms of assistance. It is clear that the Pivot is the community lung of Beauport. I want to salute the hard work, affability, and empathy of its executive director, Ms. Jeanette Fauché, a true inspiration for the next generation. Jeanette has been with Pivot since its founding. Thank you, Jeanette, for these 40 years. Thank you also to the board of directors and especially to the volunteers who help and who love so much. Long live Pivot. Happiness needs you. The Honourable Member for Hochelaga. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week, I had the very great pleasure of attending the 34th edition of the Esteem Awards Gala of Eastern Montreal Chamber of Commerce. I want to highlight all the, the uh, organizations in this riding. For two, after two years of a pandemic, the gala was finally able to take place in person with over 500 entrepreneurs, organizations, and businesses. Uh, this seeks to recognize innovation, leadership, and the determination of the participants in Eastern Montreal. People in Eastern Montreal are proud, and they really have a strong feeling of belonging. I salute all this year's winners, especially those in my riding. Bravo to Dermatory Laboratories, winner in manufacturing, Annie Martel, Terra Soie, an ecological green store. Women's winner in the women's leadership category and the Cuisine Collective Oshalaga Maison of winner of the Orchid Award in the organization category. This allows us to recognize the extraordinary talents of everybody who contributes to the development of this region. Thank you. The Honorable Member for Brandon Soros. I rise to celebrate the life of Mr. Brian Franklin, who sadly left us all too soon after a brief battle with cancer. He was a pillar in his community of Deloraine and was known far and wide for his public service and his love of hockey. Brian was a teacher for 36 years and was one of the best math teachers in the province of Manitoba. He served as a town councillor and then the mayor of Deloraine for 16 years. He brought people together and was always willing to listen to those who needed help. His greatest, my greatest memories of Brian were seeing him at the hockey rink or on the golf course. And I was thrilled when he became the president of Hockey Manitoba. I was incredibly proud of how he led the organization and helped shape the future of so many players. I consider him a friend and I know all who knew him are grieving with his passing. My heart goes out to his wife Val and his children Tony and Carrie as they celebrate his life. May he rest in peace. Member for Mississauga East Cooksville. Mr. Speaker, today is Fibromyalgia Awareness Day. We join millions who are participating on this day by holding various events to raise awareness for fibromyalgia, an invisible and debilitating chronic condition. In my riding of Mississauga East Cooksville, Ms. Susan Monaco has been a strong voice for those affected by fibromyalgia. After being diagnosed in 1989, Ms. Monaco suffered quite a bit, just like more than 1.5 million Canadians, mostly women, who suffer from the fibromyalgia syndrome. Today, Ms. Monaco leads a local support group for all those suffering from fibromyalgia. I hear that the most frustrating thing for those suffering is that on the outside they look just fine, though in reality, fibromyalgia can severely limit a person's ability to carry out ordinary daily activities. In honour of the 30th anniversary of, of the International Fibromyalgia Awareness Day, I'm pleased to share that the City of Mississauga Civic Centre clock tower will light up purple. I would like to give a big shout out to my constituent, Susan Monaco, and her Fibro Mississauga group for their tireless advocacy to bring awareness to fibromyalgia. Thank you. Merci. The Honourable Member for York Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let me share some names who are an important part of the fabric of this country. 
Leah Roback, social activist and feminist, Moshe Safdie, architect, Rosalia Bella, Supreme Court Justice, William Shatner, actor and now astronaut, <laughs> Getty Lee, Leonard Cohen, and yes, even Drake, all musicians and creatives. This month of May is Jewish Heritage Month across Canada. It's an opportunity to celebrate the diversity, creativity, and contributions of Jewish Canadians that have been woven into the fabric and history of Canadian life. Jewish Canadians have shown leadership in academia, law, medicine, music, sports, theater, literature, community service, and so much more. Jewish leaders have been our teachers, our neighbors, and our friends. They've advocated for and inspired us to pursue peace, equality, and inclusivity in the Canada we share today, and have done it often in the face of unspeakable discrimination and anti-Semitism. Yet through their dedication and allyship, they have shone the light on what is possible for better for everyone. That's why this month is about celebrating those who I've mentioned and many, many more. Mr. Speaker, I encourage all Canadians to take some time to learn and celebrate the heritage and accomplishments of Jewish Canadians from coast to coast to coast. Nice. The Honourable Member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today on International Nurses Day, I rise to pay tribute to nurses across Canada and the world who selflessly serve their communities, often at a great personal sacrifice. I would particularly like to honour one of my constituents who has tirelessly served her community throughout the entire pandemic, caring for COVID-19 patients at the Joseph Brand Hospital in Burlington, Ontario. A hero who came home with Google marks imprinted on her face, tired after 12 hours on her feet in full PPE, putting her own health at risk to care for hundreds of Canadians who needed it most. A hero who, despite the challenging conditions in understaffed hospital, woke up every day and went to work, her eyes smiling to her patients above her mask. A hero who, above all, is the most amazing mother to our two daughters. <laughs> to my wife, Angela, who is on the hill today, most of all, you're my hero. I love you. <laughs> SO31s, these statements are awesome, and we also have to remind folks not to acknowledge the presence or the presence of somebody in the gallery. I just, uh, oh, I know, I'm glad she's here, but there you go. The Honourable Member for Niagara Centre. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, May marks Lyme Disease Awareness Month. Families across Canada have their lives turned upside down because of Lyme, like the Peters family in my riding. This family has two daughters who have battled chronic Lyme disease over the past eight years with debilitating neurological symptoms. Like many Canadians, the Peters family does not know when, where, or how they were bitten by a tick and acquired Lyme. The Peters sisters did not have a bullseye rash, nor did they have, similar to other many people who get Lyme, some of those uh, different uh, uh, instances uh, where they would know that they had Lyme. Mr. Speaker, I encourage all members of this House to educate themselves on the experiences of individuals with Lyme and to visit canlyme.com to find out more and get more information. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Coast of Bay Central, Notre Dame. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, 7,500 health care professionals were promised for rural Canada by the Liberals in the 2021 election campaign. Coast of Bay Central Notre Dame, like much of rural Canada, is in a health care crisis. My constituent, 40-year-old Preston Party, who happens to be in Ottawa today, spent five <laughs> days on a stretcher in an understaffed hospital after suffering a heart attack. Weeks later, he was transferred to Ottawa, where he finally received his triple bypass surgery. Hey. Constituents of mine, like Preston, don't want to hear the Minister of Health give them COVID stats from the USA, or talk about the wonderful relationship that this NDP Liberal government has with the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. Hey. This government, this Prime Minister, has broken their promise to rural Canadians like Preston, and it's time for them to address this crisis and put the care back into health care. Yeah. 
And of course, as always, we, re we recognize and, and, and are happy people are joining us here in the House of Commons today. Uh, the Honourable Member for Saskatoon Grasswood. Mr. Speaker, you know, it's been more than two years since COVID arrived in this country, and public health experts across Canada have been abundantly clear. We will live for years with COVID. Vaccination rates in this country are incredibly high. And the fourth dose of vaccinations are being rolled out. Transmissions, hospitalizations, deaths are all down significantly from the peak and Canadians want to get their pre-COVID lives back again. Most of the provinces and territories across this country, including mine, in the province of Saskatchewan, have lifted all mandates. Yeah. It is time for this Government of Canada to join the provinces and remove mandates from all areas within the federal jurisdiction. Yeah. I just want to remind folks to keep the, the noise down just a little bit so that the SO31s uh, can get done so that people have a, a good clip to send home. The Honourable Member for Richmond Centre. Mr. Speaker, the month of May marks the 20th anniversary of Asian Heritage Month. And this year we celebrate the theme of continuing a legacy of greatness. I'm honoured to represent Richmond Centre, a riding with predominant Asian population who have helped shape Canada as a great, diverse nation it is today. I want to thank the generation of Asians who have chosen to call Richmond their home and share their unique culture, religion and history to all of us. Despite the unfortunate rise of anti-Asian sentiment during the pandemic, Asian Canadians have continued to show their strength through their resilience and activism. I hope we can all work together to build a more peaceful and multicultural community. This month, let us celebrate the legacy of greatness that Asian Canadians has contributed across Canada. Happy Asian Heritage Month. The Honourable Member for Algoma, Manitoulin, Kathis Casing. Mr. Speaker, I wish to pay tribute to the Community Futures Network of Canada and the excellent work it's doing to diversify, support, and strengthen the economy of rural and communities. Community Futures Network of Canada works to support those communities by providing small business loans, tools, and training for people looking to start or expand their business. In Ontario alone, during 2020-2021, the Community Futures Development Corporations recruited over 1,000 volunteers, issued over $7.5 million in business loans and created over 6,000 jobs. In addition, the CFDCs provided over $116 million in business loan relief and helped maintain 8,500 jobs. In Algoma, Manitoulin, Kappas Casing, many entrepreneurs have taken advantage of the services provided by CFDCs more specifically that of Wabatec, East Algoma, Superior East, Naldeski, Lambac, North Claybelt and Sault Ste. Marie, whose team members are dedicated to make Northern Ontario a business-friendly destination. Today, I say thank you. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Shefford, Mr. Speaker. As the pandemic comes to an end, the annual pro-life demonstration returns to the federal parliament. Of course, opponents of women's rights to a safe abortion have the right to demonstrate. Parliament Hill is the most appropriate place to do so. Certainly more appropriate than intimidating young women in front of health care clinics. The Bloc Québécois has no problem with the religious right gathering in the courtyard outside parliament. Where we do have a problem is when religion finds itself inside the parliament, in a Canadian parliament where the official opposition finances itself on the front lawns of churches, in a parliament where 40 conservatives vote 100 percent of the time on the anti-choice right side, in a parliament that has just voted to continue praying every day before work begins. In this parliament, the bloc wants to tell the women of Quebec that we will stand up for your rights, for our rights. We will not accept any backsliding. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Grand Prairie, Mackenzie. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Canadians proudly oppose discrimination. But today, 7 million Canadians are being subjected to government-imposed discrimination that bars them from boarding an aircraft in Canada because they have not been fully vaccinated against COVID. This is uniquely Canadian. Currently, no other country in the world has a similar policy. In fact, most countries have lifted the end and ended their COVID restrictions. Canada's chief public health officer has been clear that it's time to end these discriminatory policies. But the Prime Minister has maintained this rule to foster hate, suspicion and division. I remind my colleagues in this House that the Prime Minister can only maintain this discrimination if the majority of us allow him to do so. Consider the 7 million Canadians who continue to be separated from their families, job opportunities, studies, weddings and funerals. I implore my colleagues in the Liberal and the NDP benches to do the right thing to end the Prime Minister's vindictive and divisive mandates. The Honourable Member for Labrador. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am pleased to recognize Mining Week. Mining activity stretches right across our country and it employs nearly 700,000 direct and indirect workers, of which nearly 17,000 are Indigenous. In 2020, the industry contributed $107 billion to Canada's GDP. Canada is a global mining power, thanks to world-class people, deposits, and environmental practices. The TMX lists more mining than any other stock exchange in the world. So in a net zero economy, this industry, they know they can reach even higher and they are ready. That is why we made an historic commitment of $3.8 billion to implement the critical mineral strategy for infrastructure, to establish value chains, to unlock projects. We doubled the mineral exploration tax credit and we're investing in R&D so that we can move closer towards sustainable mining in a way we know it can be done by Canada. I ask honorable members today to join me in recognizing National Mining Week and the importance of mining to Canadian prosperity. Oral questions, question oral, on the Rabbi Deputy de Megantic. The Honourable Member for Megantic Lerable. Mr. Speaker, in January 2017, the Prime Minister created a big problem at Roxham Road with his treat, hashtag Welcome to Canada. What he did was create a gap in the Safe Third Country Agreement, encouraging thousands of illegal migrants to come to Canada. Five years later, the situation is worse than ever before, and Quebec has been calling for Roxham Road to be closed down. The Prime Minister didn't hesitate to close the borders during the pandemic, but now he is hesitating. Why not suspend the Safe Third Country Agreement? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we believe in our asylum and immigration system. We work closely with our partners at the border, and we work with our American counterparts on questions related to our common border, including the Safe Third Country Agreement. We are always working closely with our partners to respect our national and international obligations when it comes to refugees. The Honourable Member. Yeah, but look at the results. The Prime Minister should stop turning a blind eye to gang violence in the streets of Montreal and elsewhere, despite all the empty rhetoric. Despite his election, since his election, the number of shootings has increased in Montreal. There have been 28 firearms related incidents uh, involving street gangs since the last update. Does the Prime Minister agree with the Chief of Police of Laval that the situation is unacceptable? The Right Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you very much for that question. Mr. Speaker, as a member from one of the big cities in Canada, from Toronto, I fully agree that we have a huge problem with firearms. 
And that's precisely why our government has taken big steps to limit firearms in our country, in our communities, and in our cities. And I would invite the Conservatives to support the steps we've taken. The Honourable Member. Mr. Speaker, what the Prime Minister is trying to do is create a false sense of security among Canadians. It's not by turning the screws on honest and law-abiding merchants and firearms owners. That's not going to stop street violence in the major cities. People are fearful for their children. The gangs, uh, gang members are afraid of nothing. They're opening fire in neighborhoods near children, and that's the fact, and it's only getting worse. What's it going to take for this government to combat the illegal arms trade, which is terrorizing people in Laval, Laval Montreal, and all across Canada? Premier Minister. The Right Honourable Prime Minister, uh, Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, once again, I'd really like to thank the member opposite for his question, because I agree. Firearms pose a serious threat in our cities, in Montreal, in Toronto, and in Vancouver. That's why our government is ready to take strong action to protect mothers and children, and I would encourage the Conservatives to support us. Official opposition. In Liberal-held ridings across the country, gun and gang violence is escalating, and it's not escalating because of law-abiding firearms owners. Last Saturday, around 3 in the morning, there was a deadly shooting on Shepherd Avenue in Scarborough. On Tuesday, police arrested the suspect, who had been arrested 48 hours earlier for an unrelated robbery. There have been 137 shootings in That's Toronto in 20... 22. Instead of wasting time going after law-abiding firearms owners, why isn't the minister protecting public safety by going after the gangsters shooting up his yeah, streets yeah. in Toronto? Yeah. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I am an MP for a downtown Toronto riding. I am the mother of Toronto teenagers. I am very aware of the danger that guns pose in our cities, in our communities, on our streets. That is why our government is taking strong measures to ban military-style assault weapons, and I would invite the Conservatives to join us. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Well, violent crime isn't just limited to the GTA. Monday night, there was a drive-by shooting not far from the Prime Minister's office in his riding of Papineau. That shooting came less than two days after another drive-by in Laval, a Liberal-held riding where a family was shot at while driving back from a birthday party. But instead of targeting criminals, the Liberals prefer to punish law-abiding hunters, collectors, and sports shooters. Can someone explain to me why this Prime Minister is more interested in protecting violent criminals and gangs in his community than the families in his community. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. You know, Mr. Speaker, farmers and hunters in rural communities do not use military-style assault weapons to hunt or to protect their cattle. These are weapons which terrorize our communities. They terrorize our big cities, but they terrorize all Canadians. That is why our government is acting to ban them. And I would welcome all members of this House. Surely we care about Canadian lives. Let's do the right thing together. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, the Trans-Canada Pipeline, it, it looks like they want to build it out of solid gold. They started out with $4.5 billion of public money. That's our money, taxpayers' money. And now we're up to $21 billion. $21 billion. Is this the government's genius plan to fight global warming, sell more oil? And the best part is that we learned today that the government has just given Trans Mountain another $10 billion. That's a total of $31 billion, Mr. Speaker. Where does it end? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, 
as we've been saying from the start, we do not intend to be the long-term owners of Trans Mountain. This project is a responsible investment in the public interest, and it has created over 12,700 well-paying jobs for the middle class. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, they say it's a loan guarantee, but we're not fooled. It's nothing more than a subsidy in disguise. They're trying to hide the fact that they're financing their beautiful gold-plated pipeline with more and more of our money. They're embarrassed, and they're being secretive about it, and I guess I get why. But either Trans Mountain, which the government owns, or the government itself will have to pay back the money. Either way, it's our taxes footing the bill. When will the government stop taking our money to finance Trans Mountain? At some point, there has to be a damn limit. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I hope everyone can understand how important it is to get a fair price for our resources on international markets. The government does not intend to be the long-term owner of the pipeline. This... Uh, the sale of this project will be announced when the project is further along and less risky and will be done in consultation with Indigenous partners. Be so. Last, the Parliamentary Budget Office last year found that the Canadian government was giving massive tax exemptions to oil and gas companies to the tune of $2.3 billion. Ooh. And then a year later, those very same companies are posting massive profits while gouging Canadians at the pumps. It's clear that this government continues to take the side of oil and gas companies, and it's hurting people. So will this government finally stop giving away these massive tax exemptions to profitable oil and gas companies and instead be on the side of people and help them out? Here, here. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as a government, we are absolutely, clearly and explicitly committed to eliminating fossil fuel subsidies. We're going to do that by 2023. We've also put forward a limit on emissions from the oil and gas industry, and we've committed to gradually reduce emissions until we reach net zero in 2050. And we're going to eliminate the flow-through share regime for fossil fuel sector activities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South fossil fuel subsidies by increasing them by billions of dollars. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I get that. <laughs> the Liberal government has given huge exemptions to oil companies, $2.3 billion worth, and those same companies posted massive profits this year, and they're continuing to gouge people at the pumps. So our question is, why do you keep helping big oil with their massive profits instead of stopping, putting an end to the huge exemptions and putting money back in people's pockets. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, as a government, it has been years that we've been committed to phasing out subsidies to the oil patch, and we will even do that before the target date. Order. Lord. Order. Merci. Thank you. The, the Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. On va même le We're even going to get there before the target date of 2023, because we know it's important. In addition, we have put forward a plan to put an absolute limit, a cap on GHG emissions, and to phase those emissions out until we achieve net zero. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, leave it to the Liberals to censor the bill C-11. In less than an hour, they were forced through a bill through this House that negatively impacts each and every Canadian who watches videos or listens to music on the internet. Making matters worse, the Prime Minister refuses to answer a simple question about how the CRTC will use their new powers to regulate the internet. Shocking. Why is this government ramming through this bill while providing no transparency 
What are they trying to hide? Cover up. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, our culture needs fair rules for tech giants, and that is exactly what our online streaming bill does. Our artists, our creators, all workers in the cultural sector depend on it. But the Conservatives are abandoning them yet again, again and again and again. They prefer to play politics. Canada needs a modern law. The cultural sector needs a modern law. It's time to move forward, Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to our debates at committee. The Honourable Member for Perth-Wellington. Again and again and again, more disinformation from the Liberal government. This is a flawed bill. The Liberals are keeping the directives they are giving to the CRTC secret until after the bill receives royal assent, and now they are forcing the bill through the House of Commons. Why? Why is the government ramming this bill through rather than providing certainty to digital first creators? To cover up. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For some reason, the Conservatives have decided to abandon our culture and our artists. The objective is the same. We want platforms to contribute to Canadian culture. We heard the concerns that were raised about social media. We got the message and we fixed it. We are making it extremely clear. Users and their content will not be regulated. The bill makes platforms contribute. That's it. It's uh, in black and white in the bill. Platforms in, users out, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Seniors across this country are calling into my office and pleading for parliamentarians to help alleviate the debilitating effect that the cost of living is having on them. Their dollar isn't going as far as it was before, and it keeps getting worse. Many seniors on fixed incomes can't make ends meet, and they've lost hope. Our seniors deserve better, and our seniors need better. Mr. Speaker, when will this government take realistic steps to lower the inflation that is devastating Canadian seniors? The Honourable Minister of Seniors. Conservatives who actually prolonged the age of retirement for seniors from 65 to 67, Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, we've been delivering for seniors. Whether it was the increase to the GIS that has actually helped over 900,000, Mr. Spe Mr. Speaker, single seniors, or of course, Mr. Speaker, um, during this pandemic, we took action to provide seniors needed support with special tax-free payments and a GST top-up, Mr. Speaker. And of course, this summer, we're delivering on our promise to increase the OES to by 10% for those 75 and seniors. Mr. Speaker, uh, seniors know that we've had their back and we're going to continue to de deliver for them. Thank you. The Honourable Member, Hastings, Lennox and Eddington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Hand in their back pocket, perhaps. For eight, nearly eight months, we have been asking this government to take substantive action to ease the crippling cost of living to our seniors. Dental care in two years will do nothing to lower food prices today. Right. A one-off, one-time payment last year does nothing to lower the cost of medicine tomorrow. As a nation, we have relied on our seniors for their sacrifices, and now they are relying on us. Mr. Speaker, our seniors have been neglected. How can this Liberal government be comfortable with that? The Honourable Minister of Seniors. Side of the house, we have been delivering for seniors since 2015. Mr. Speaker, this actually allows me to talk a little bit about Budget 2022, yes. which has made sure that seniors are supported. $5.3 billion over five years for dental care for a Canadian program, meaning seniors age 65 and up to income of below $90,000 will be able to access this. An additional $20 million for New Horizons for Seniors program. Mr. Speaker, we're doubling the qualifying expense for the Home Accessibility Tax Credit. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we're delivering for them, and we're, we're going to continue to make sure seniors, uh, we're going to have their back. Thank right you. The Honourable Member for Kelowna Lake Country. Well, Mr. Speaker, there is more misinformation. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, I was speaking with a senior from Kelowna Lake Country who said her and her husband had to go back to work part-time just to pay for basic necessities. She said her electric bill is in one hand while looking at her empty pantry, and they had to make the decision whether, whether to buy electricity or to go and purchase food. Inflation numbers do not count capture all the costs increasing for people, and seniors on fixed incomes are some of the hardest hit. Can the minister tell us what specific actions the NDP Liberal government is explicitly taking to reduce inflation? 
The Honourable Minister of Seniors. Mr. Speaker, since the beginning, our government has been delivering for seniors. One of the first things that we've done, Mr. Speaker, is to restore the age of retirement uh, back to 65 from 67, Mr. Speaker. We've enhanced the CPP, Mr. Speaker. We have raised the GIS for single seniors. That has helped over 900,000 seniors, Mr. Speaker. This summer, we are increasing the OES by 10 percent for those 75. Mr. Speaker, we're making high-speed internet more affordable for seniors. And in Budget 2022, we announced a creation of dental care program for low-income seniors. Mr. Speaker, seniors know we are delivering for them, and we're going to continue to do just that. The Honourable Member, Kamloops Thompson Caribou. The only thing they're delivering is less prosperity, Mr. Speaker. Now, when it comes to housing, Mr. Speaker, the housing minister likes to talk about what he's invested. What he doesn't like to talk about, though, are results. Why? Because there are none when housing prices have doubled over the last seven years. If this housing minister had a radio show, Mr. Speaker, it should be entitled All Talk, No Rock. Will this housing minister admit that that his, that his strategy and his government's strategy has been an abject failure with all talk and no rock. The Honourable Minister of Housing. Speaker, uh, we are dead set on making sure that we continue our investments in housing. Budget 2022 has prioritized uh, affordable housing investments in addition to uh, help for first-time home buyers as well as doubling housing supply. We are making sure that through the national housing strategy we work with developers, private sector, nonprofits, municipalities and provinces to make sure that we get the help that Canadians need so that each and every Canadian has a safe and affordable place to call home. Bravo. 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 The Honourable Member for Jean Pierre. Mr. Speaker, the price of gas is hurting Quebecers and Quebec businesses, especially in the regions. Meanwhile, oil companies have been raking in record profits in the last quarter, almost $3 billion for Suncor, $1.1 billion for Imperial Oil, and the same thing for TC Energy. But what's most infuriating is that despite these massive profits, the federal government is offering a $10 billion loan guarantee for Trans Mountain and $2.4 billion for the oil patch in the last budget. Does the Prime Minister agree that there's something embarrassing about subsidizing the oil patch instead of helping the people who are getting gouged? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, it's important to point out that inflation is a global phenomenon. The pandemic and the illegal, Putin's illegal war in uh, Ukraine are factors, but we understand that the cost of gas is a problem for Canadians, and that's why in our budget there is dental care. We've doubled the uh, credit for a first home purchase and uh, credits for renovations and a $500 for payment for people who are having trouble affording housing. President. The Honourable Member for Jonquière. Mr. Speaker, it's a double-dip festival for the producers of dirty oil. Ordinary people are paying twice. They pay crazy prices at the pump, and then they pay with their taxes for the subsidies the federal government gives to these same, same oil companies, which are raking in the cash. It's the middle class, their wages are being transferred to the oil billionaires. Mr. Speaker, the oil patch doesn't need subsidies. Will the Prime Minister turn off the public money tap and instead support those hardest hit by rising fuel prices? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to say a bit about carbon capture. This doesn't just involve the oil patch or steel or concrete or aluminum. It's important for Quebec, for example. These are important industries to Quebec and to Canada's economy. And these are also the industries that have to reduce their emissions. Carbon capture will help those industries too, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Jonquière. Mr. Speaker, 
the price of fuel is even worse for agriculture, fishing, independent trucking, taxi driving, and many other industries. These people are at risk of going bankrupt. We have entire industries in Quebec that are suffering major losses without the slightest support from the federal government. Meanwhile, the oil patch in the West is reaping record profits and continues to be subsidized at every turn. Well, when will the government stop giving our money to the oil companies and instead, instead fund the victims of fuel prices and the environmental transition? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, once again, I'd like to talk about the importance of carbon capture. We need carbon capturing because that will help meet our GHG reduction targets. This will create good jobs in the technology sector and support the energy transition. And it will also be beneficial to the industries of tomorrow including uh, concrete, steel, and aluminum. Mr. Speaker, it is Mental Health Awareness Month. Everyone in this House can agree that the mental health of Canadians is a very important issue. Well, maybe not everyone. During the election, this government promised to invest $4.5 billion in funding mental health service through Canadians' uh, mental health transfer including $250 million in 21-22 and $625 million in 22-23. However, there is no mention of the funding timeline in the federal government's 2022 budget. Why did this government break their commitment to fund mental health? Yeah, yeah. Well, then I'm the Secretary Speaker, our government has made historic investments in mental health, including $5 billion to the provinces and territories through ongoing bilateral agreements. We are also engaging with provinces and territories to inform the development of a new mental health transfer, building on the principles of the Canada Health Act, as well as sharing the data on indicators and in outcomes. We remain fully committed to the additional $4.5 billion over five years to ensure mental health care is treated as a full and equal part of Canada's universal public health care system. Honourable Member for Edmonton, Wetaskiwin. Mr. Speaker, 66 times while they were trying to get elected, the Liberal Party used the words mental health in their platform. But we're losing 11 Canadians every day to suicide, and we still don't have a three-digit suicide prevention hotline. We're losing 19 Canadians every day to a raging opioid crisis that continues to worsen. And now the Liberals have broken their cornerstone mental health commitment from an election campaign fought just months ago. Can the minister explain to Canadians struggling with their mental health why her party broke the commitment it so solemnly made to help them when it was looking for their votes? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. The government is working to implement this crisis line as quickly and as effect effectively as possible. While the CRTC is completing its process, PHAC is working concurrently to ensure there will be capacity for the new line to connect people to the most appropriate support in the most appropriate way. We are also working closely with U.S. Admiral Levine and Dr. Delphine Rittman and their team to learn from the ongoing American crisis line implementation process started back in 2018. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Wetaskiwin. Mr. Speaker, that didn't even come close to answering the question we actually asked. Mr. Speaker, we've asked consistently very fair, straightforward questions on the issue of the Canada mental health transfer. Last week, the minister dismissed them as, quote, annoying and despicable. Mm. If the minister is annoyed with anyone, perhaps it should be with her own prime minister, who's put her in such an awkward, indefensible position by breaking a clear promise to the most vulnerable of Canadians. If anything is despicable, it's that. Why did this Liberal government break a clear commitment, a clear commitment, on one of the most critical issues facing Canadians today? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. I'd like to thank my colleague for his question. There's a, press, a process that we're following. It's a serious process. The CRTC is studying the recent consultations and ensuring that each uh, call is directed effectively. 
This entails significant changes to our telecommunications systems uh, all across the country. And we've also invested $3.7 million additional dollars for a total of $50 million to support distress centres all across Canada. Member for Victoria. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals just approved a new $10 billion loan guarantee for TMX. Instead of supporting workers in the transition to the green economy, this government is continuing their failed approach, handing over billions to big oil. The Liberals never should have bought the pipeline. The government's own watchdog confirmed they should expect to lose money when they sell it. And now they're putting even more public dollars on the line for this financial boondoggle. How many more billions is this government willing to risk for a pipeline that is fueling the climate crisis. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government understands how important it is for us as Canadians to get our resources to market and to get fair value for them. We do not intend to be the long-term owner of the Trans Mountain Pipeline. A divestment process will be initiated once the project is more advanced, de-risked and, essentially, when consultations with Indigenous people are completed. The Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. Carbon bomb. It's a term referring to any new fossil fuel project that would plunge the planet dangerously past the 1.5 degrees Celsius line into climate crisis. That's why the International Energy Agency says there simply can't be any more fossil fuel projects. So let's talk about the billions this government has put into the carbon bomb. They own the TMX pipeline. Spare us the talk about an emissions cap. This is about burning an extra million barrels of oil a day. So given what's at risk, why did the environment minister decide decide to act as a sock puppet for the big oil lobby. Hello. The Honourable Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I would like to remind my honourable colleague that we have decided to go after pollution, Mr. Speaker, and that's exactly what we're doing with our plan. And in fact, as oil production has increased in 2019, pollution has gone down. And, and they should be happy about that, Mr. Speaker. They should be happy about that. Production went up, pollution went down, Mr. Speaker. What else do they want? I'm really trying to figure out who was heckling who here. This is, <laughs> this is all kind of strange. Uh, the Honourable Member for London West. Mr. Speaker, uh, next week will mark Endangered Species Day and soon after International Day for Biological Diversity. It is a timely uh, it's time to reflect on nature and conservation, particularly in Canada urban spaces, which are home to three quarters of Canadians. Urban parks have a role to play in supporting species to survive and offering residents benefits like cool spaces among heat islands in our urban environments. It is of great interest to many Canadians when the National Urban Parks Program was announced in uh, last August. Can the Minister of Environment and Climate Change share with this House how this program has advanced since then? The Honourable Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the Honourable Member from London West for her question and her hard work. And I would like to thank the Member for Windsor Tecumseh for his ongoing support for this file. I'm happy to announce that Parks Canada and Transport Canada are signing a Memorandum of Understanding to pursue a transfer of the Ojibwe shorelands from the Windsor Port Authority to Parks Canada so that it can be included in the future national urban park. This is a significant step forward in establishing the park, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to work closely with partners to establish Windsor's first national urban park. The Honourable Member for Sturgeon River Parkland. Mr. Speaker, the Commissioner for the RCMP, Brenda Lucky, just gave shocking testimony at committee, which contradicts a key claim from this Liberal government. For weeks, the Minister of Public Safety has claimed that law enforcement asked the government to invoke the Emergencies Act. In fact, on May 3rd, the Minister said he acted on the recommendations of law enforcement. But Commissioner Lucky testified that the RCMP never asked this government to invoke the Act. Will the Minister tell Canadians who in law enforcement Enforcement asked the government to invoke the Emergencies Act, or will he admit he just made it up? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Speaker, let me take the opportunity to refresh my honourable colleague's uh, memory with what Commissioner Lucky actually said 
at the committee. She said that the Emergencies Act allowed police to maintain a security perimeter and refuse entry of individuals traveling to the illegal protest with the intent of participating. She said it gave police the enforcement authority to arrest individuals who continue to supply fuel, food and other materials. She said it gave police new powers, Mr. Speaker, to compel individuals to provide essential goods and or services for the removal. That's what the Commissioner said, Mr. Speaker, not the paraphrasing. The Honourable Member for Sturgeon River Parkland. Well, Mr. Speaker, in further shocking testimony, the RCMP Commissioner admitted at committee that border protests were cleared without using any powers under the Emergencies Act. Well, on May 3rd, the Minister said that they needed to invoke the Act to clear the border. Clearly, the Minister and the Commissioner can't both be right. So will the Minister tell Canadians, is the RCMP Commissioner misleading Canadians, or is he? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. I'll tell, I'll tell this chamber who's misleading Canadians. It's that honourable colleague over there who continues to paraphrase very recklessly and inaccurately the actual testimony of the Commissioner who said that she used the Emergencies Act to restore public safety, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue to be transparent with all members of this chamber and all Canadians about why it is that we invoked that act. It was to protect Canadians. Now we're having vigorous debate. There's some vigorous debate here. Order. Order. All right. Let's hold on. The Honourable Member for Shelbourne at saint Shell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The testimony of the Commissioner of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police to the Parliamentary Committee flatly contradicts the Liberal government's position. For several weeks, the Minister of Public Safety and the Prime Minister have been saying that law enforcement had asked the government to invoke the Emergency Measures Act. Indeed, on the 3rd of May, the Minister said that he acted on the recommendation of law enforcement, but Commissioner Lucky testified that the RCMP never asked the government to invoke the Act in the first place. Can the Minister tell us who asked to invoke the Act, or will he admit that he made it all up? The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr Speaker, as I have already mentioned a few times, the testimony of the RCMP commissioners at the invocation of the Emergency Measures Act was there to help to restore public safety. It offered new powers and new authorities to police bodies in order to protect the health and safety and security of Canadians. That is the reason for which we invoked the Emergency Measures Act. The Honourable Member for Charlesbourg Haute Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, Will the Minister deny that the RCMP Commissioner, in her testimony, mentioned that the police did not need the Emergency Measures Act in order to clear the border? Perhaps it helped other things, but the most important thing is that the Commissioner confirmed that the RCMP did not, use to use the, did not need to use the EMA to clear the border. Is that right? Yes or no? The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr Speaker, the testimony from the RCMP Commissioner was that the Emergency Measures Act dissuaded illegal protests and illegal protesters from going back to that community because these were illegal protests. The, um, the events were very clear. It's the Conservatives and only the Conservatives who seem to not understand the severity of the situation for which we invoked the Emergency Measures Act, that we invoked for the protection of Canadians. The Honourable Member for Repentigny. Mr. Speaker, times are tough for the current Minister of the Environment. He is being sued by Equiterre, the, the very environmental group he founded himself. Equiterre accuses the Minister of betraying his climate obligations to the world by approving the Baie du Nord project. However, he must have known that he could not accept the extraction of a billion barrels of oil in the middle of, fragile, of a fragile marine ecosystem at depths that would prevent any rapid response to a leak. The minister knows Equiterre well. It is his family. Is he really surprised at the end of the day that Equiterre is suing him? The Honourable Minister for the Environment and Climate Change. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank my colleague for her question. You know, Mr. Speaker, on our side, 
Well, she says we are going too far when it comes to environmental impact assessments. On the other hand, we have environmental groups that think we are doing not enough. What we are doing is navigating a just middle in order to make env environment protection move forward. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Ropontigny. You know, Mr. Speaker, when the current Minister for the Environment and Climate Change was appointed, even we in the Bloc Québécois saw a sign of hope. We were happy. We were like, finally, an ecologist. That is how disappointed we are with his latest decision to authorize the Bé du Nord project. Never did we think that one day this man would be lauded by the House of Commons, by the Conservatives, rather than sued by Equiterre. What more will it take for the minister to finally understand that his attempt to change the system from within in the Liberal government of an oil state is a failure? The Honourable Minister for the Environment and Climate Change. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have a friend who recently said, when there is a fire, you need more firefighters, not fewer firefighters. And so we need more environmentalists in the House of Commons to make the environment portfolio move forward. I'm so happy to be here with my colleagues because for the past five months, we have presented a plan that, was allow, that will allow Canada to meet its objectives when it comes to reducing greenhouse gases, irrespective of what happens with oil and gas production. Pollution will go down. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for South Surrey White Rock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We saw reports Tuesday of an Afghan interpreter for the Canadian Army being thrown in a steel container and beaten within an inch of his life by the Taliban. Oh my. Responding about bringing 40,000 already outside the country is deliberately misleading. Between 600 to 1,000 of our allies that this government left behind have been executed by the Taliban. Minister, if Canada has our Afghan allies' backs, why are so many being hunted down and executed with no help from this Liberal government? Here. The Honourable Minister of Immigration. Mr. Speaker, the kind of circumstance the Honourable Member described is exactly why we have made one of the most substantial commitments of any nation in the world to resettle 40,000 Afghan refugees here in Canada. I'm pleased to share, Mr. Speaker, that as of this week, when we arrived in Ottawa, there were 12,600 Afghan refugees. Today, there are 12,900. By tomorrow, there will be 13,200. We are seeing a regular pace of arrivals because we have made a commitment and put a plan in place to welcome some of the world's most vulnerable people to Canada. We will not waver on our commitment until we make good on it to the people who helped us during our time of need. Calgary Forest Lawn. Well, testimony at the Afghan Committee has been filled with tragic personal stories and underscore the crisis Afghans are facing under Taliban rule. People are being tortured and killed while waiting to come to Canada. We even saw a 10-year-old girl killed while her application was stuck in this liberal-made immigration backlog. Delays, red tape, and unreasonable requirements has made this process almost impossible for stranded Afghans. Will this government do the right thing and implement the Conservatives' ask for single-journey travel documents for Afghans? The Honourable Minister of Immigration. The Honourable Member's uh, use of one party's name for his own political interest is beyond disgraceful. The reality is, Mr. Speaker, the Conservative Party of Canada campaigned on a commitment to bring precisely zero Afghan refugees to Canada. When they were in power, Mr. Speaker, over the course of four years, they were able to bring 800 people to Canada. Their extended families were not allowed to come. That demanded that we create a special pathway to make space for 5,000 of them because they're the very people that the Conservatives left behind. I will not take lessons on the Afghan resettlement initiative uh, on the basis of their history. They do not deserve that credit. We will continue to go forward to help some of the world's most vulnerable with or without them. The Honourable Member for Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Mr. Speaker, during testimony of the Afghanistan Committee, both Global Affairs Canada and the Canadian Armed Forces have confirmed lessons learned reviews were conducted by their respective departments in regard to the evacuation of Afghans from Kabul. Further, testimony confirmed that there was an interdepartmental review led by PCO conducted. 
So will the chair of the Afghanistan Committee highlight why it's essential that the Liberal government release these crucial reviews immediately to the committee for inclusion in the committee's mandated report back to Parliament by June the 8th? Good question. The Honourable Chair of the Afghan Committee. The Vice Chair. Bueller. The Honourable Vice Chair. Respond. Parliament is. Oh. So long a sec. You can only ask questions about the agenda of the committee, unfortunately. So is there... The Honourable Minister of, of Immigration. Mr. Speaker, I've heard around pitching around a hitter in baseball, but never on the floor of the House of Commons. There... Let's clarify this just a little bit. The Honourable Member for uh, Bruce Gray Owens, maybe re-ask the question. Here again. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, during testimony of the Afghanistan Committee, both Global Affairs Canada and the Canadian Armed Forces have confirmed lessons learned reviews were conducted by their respective departments in regards to the evacuation of Afghans from Kabul. Further, testimony confirmed there was an interdepartmental review led by PCO and it was conducted. So, in this case, in the interest of transparency, will the Liberal government release these completed, crucial reviews immediately to the Afghanistan Committee for inclusion in the committee's mandated report back to Parliament before the June the 8th? The Honourable Minister of Immigration. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for his question. In the many conversations we've shared, uh, seeking to only improve the government's efforts to welcome more Afghan refugees, I take his efforts as being sincere. I will point out that we continue to work with different departments to ensure that we can put a plan in place to succeed in this effort to bring 40,000 Afghan refugees to Canada. There are certain pieces of information, obviously, in the middle of the operation that could put at risk the security of some of the individuals who are seeking to come to Canada. To the extent that we can offer and create increased transparency, including through my own two-hour hour appearance before the committee, we'll do whatever we can to ensure we enhance that transparency without compromise on the security interests of those involved. The Honourable Member for dorval lachine -La -Salle. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister responsible for the Economic Development Agency of Canada for the regions of Quebec recently announced numerous contributions to support Quebec businesses. We can mention, among other things, financial assistance of $1.2 million from the federal government for Chocolat de la Montagne de Sherbrooke. Could the government inform us what kind of support this could bring to Quebec companies like this one that will receive financial assistance from the federal government? Thank you very much. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank my colleague for her question, and I would also like to highlight her extraordinary work for the citizens of her riding. Unlike some of our colleagues in this House, we believe that the real issue of concern to Quebecers are having a strong economy and good jobs. This is the reason for which we are proud to help small and medium-sized businesses in all regions of Quebec, such as Chocolat de Montagne in Sherbrooke, to give entrepreneurs uh, the means to achieve their ambitions. And this is just the beginning, Mr. Speaker. Stay tuned for the rest of our work. The Honourable Member of Fort McMurray, Cold Lake. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Jonathan applied for his daughter Victoria's passport at the Service Canada Centre in Fort McMurray in March. The passport still hasn't been processed, and he doesn't have the luxury to drive five hours each way to the passport office in Edmonton and camp out overnight to hopefully get a walk-in appointment. They want to travel to see Victoria's dying great-grandmother. This is hurting rural Canadians. When will the minister admit this is a crisis and help little Victoria get her passport? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the Honourable Member for her question. Mr. Speaker, our 
Public servants have been working night and day, overtime and weekends, to catch up with the overwhelming demand of Canadians for their passports. We understand that there are unique circumstances for some individuals in travel, and we want to, our current priority is to ensure that Canadians with planned travel are able to do so. Those who have emergency needs can be met through special measures, through Service Canada offices, and through the additional phone lines that have been opened. Every single wicket across this country, 564, Mr. Speaker, have been opened to serve Canadians. Thank here, here. you. The Honourable Member for Richmond Athabasca. Mr. Speaker, while in normal times it took 20 days to get a passport, we are now talking about over 40 days. People are unable to get through on the phone lines, and Service Canada even charges Canadians the cost of transferring their application to Quebec City, even though they are responsible themselves for the delays. The situation was predictable with the return of pleasure and business travel with the end of the pandemic. And on top of that, the 10-year passport deadline was coming up this year. Mr. Speaker, can the Liberal government finally show a modicum of leadership and solve this problem once and for all, for Roger, Pierre and Isabelle, so that all Canadians can finally get their passport as rapidly as possible? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Honourable Member, for his question, Mr. Speaker, since December of last year, we hired 500 additional passport workers to process three new center processing centres, 303 Service Canada centres. In addition, those who follow the process and have submitted the correct required documents according to the guidelines have, passed, have no additional fees to pay for expedited passports. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to serve Canadians. Well done. The Honourable Member for Calgary Rocky Ridge. Mr. Speaker, my constituency office is inundated with calls from constituents unable to access passport services, and I'm not alone. I'm sure that every Liberal member of this House, including the Minister herself, are experiencing exactly the same thing. Yeah. The backlog caused by this government's lack of preparedness affects Canadians' ability to travel abroad, to work, to, for school, or to reunite with family members. Will the Minister tell us on what date Will the backlog be cleared? General Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Families, Children and Social Development. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for his question, but as I mentioned, 100 percent of of the Service Canada passport wickets are open from coast to coast to coast, serving Canadians. In addition to the 500 additional employees, the additional three processing centres that we've opened, each Service Canada centre is available to reach Canadians when they need it most. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for New Market Aurora. Mr. Speaker, our Liberal government restored the age of eligibility on old age security back to 65 from 67. Our government knows that older the seniors get, the more financial difficulties that they have. Could the Minister of Seniors please update the House on the work that the government will do to enhance the financial security for older seniors in my riding of Newmarket Aurora and in Canada? The Honourable Minister of Seniors. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague from New Market Aurora for that excellent question and for his advocacy for seniors, not just in his riding, but indeed from coast to coast to coast. Mr. Speaker, we know as seniors age, their health and home care costs rise, all while they're more likely to be unable to work, have disabilities, or to be widowed. Older seniors face increased care expenses and are at greater risk of running out of savings. That is why, Mr. Speaker, this summer we will be delivering on our promise to increase the old age security by 10 percent for seniors. 75 and older, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, since 2015, seniors know that we've had their back and we will continue to deliver for them. Excellent. Thank you. The Honourable Member for South Okanagan, West Kootenai. Mr. Speaker, today an open letter to the Prime Minister signed by nearly 300 top scientists and scientific organizations highlighted that Canada's best and brightest graduate and postgraduate students, postdoctoral students, are living in poverty due to the inadequate funding they receive. The scientists point out that the dollar value of federal scholarships have not changed since 2003. We need to increase the scholarship amounts and index them to inflation. How can we expect to keep these brilliant young scientists in Canada when we force them to work for less than minimum wage? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Well, Mr. Speaker, over the last seven years, we've helped to rebuild Canada's world-class science and research sectors. 
Our government has been steadfast in its support of all scientists and researchers. That's why in Budget 2022, Mr. Speaker, it proposed $38.3 million over four years for the federal granting councils to add new, internationally recruited Canada Excellence Research Chairs in the fields of science, technology, engineering and math. Budget 2022 also provides $40.9 million to Canada's research granting agencies to support targeted scholarships and fellowships for promising black student researchers. We will continue to support robust science research ecosystem that reflects Canada's strengths and advances Canadians' interests. Nice the Honourable Member for Kitchener Centre. Mr. Speaker, today in response to questions from the Bloc and the NDP on a new $10 billion loan guarantee for the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion, the Deputy Prime Minister uh, cited a net zero by 2050 condition. Well, net zero by 2050 doesn't matter if we blow through our carbon uh, a budget decades before. She calls it responsible while the PBO has said the project doesn't even make economic sense. Yeah, yeah. She cites a cap on emissions when she plans on increasing production and exporting the em emissions. When will the government invest as much in a prosperous transition for workers as they have in this economic and ecological failure? Here, here. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. absolutely understands the urgency of climate action. That is why we have invested more than $100 billion in climate action. That is why we have introduced a price on pollution, the most powerful market-based mechanism for changing the way we run our economy. When it comes to TMX, Mr. Speaker, I think all Canadians understand how important it is for our country to get the value for our natural resources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, that's all the time for question period today. I'm sure we have a couple of points of order. We have a point of order from the gentleman for Parkland State. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise on a point of order arising out of question period in response to my questions about what appears to be contradictory testimony from the RCMP Commissioner and the Minister of Public Safety. The Minister of Public Safety accused me of being reckless and misleading the House. I think, you know, it gets hot in here. I've certainly, it gets hot in here, and I know I'm guilty of that, but I would ask that the Minister uh, apologize for this unparliamentary language. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, the member for his intervention. I give the opportunity, but I would say that we all have to be careful in what we say. Our words are important in this House of Commons for all Canadians. Uh, the, other day, the Honourable Member for Lac-Saint-Jean. Mr. Speaker,